You're listening to the Creepy Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. All right, so it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 115. Interview with Asheville Cryptid Society. Yes, very nice. So we are back again doing an uh, audio podcast and maybe some video to go along with it. But if this is your very first time tuning in to Creep Geeks Podcast, we very much appreciate it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so if you're wondering what kind of podcast this is, what kind of podcast is this, Omi? Broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our Creep Geeks Bunker Studio in the mountains of Western North Carolina. We're an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the strange, the stupid, paranormal, and tech topics circulating the web. Yes, very nice. And if you'd like to participate in the podcast, you can certainly do that. There's a couple different ways you can do that. You can actually do that through calling our phone number. We have a phone number that you can call. It's 575-208-4025. And yes, that is a Roswell area code. Yes, that makes it spooky. Now, it's a voicemail, so if you're expecting to talk to us directly, that's not going to happen. No. So, if you'd like to call and maybe share a little story, an instance, or something like that, something you want to kind of tell us about, like a strange happening or, or whatever it winds up being, you can just leave a message and we will get to it. And uh, also, uh, full anonymity if you want it. Yep. Uh, otherwise, so. you can always contact us through the Contact Us link on our website, which is creepgeeks.com, or email us, contact at creepgeeks.com. Yes. And you can listen to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio. Basically, anywhere you can get a podcast, you can listen to us. And if you'd like to watch us, you can find us on Facebook, but you can also find us on our YouTube channel. And if you go to YouTube and you type Creep Geeks, you'll find us. Yes. Now, when the live stream happens, because we do that periodically, we typically send out announcements. So if you'd like to be a part of the live stream and be able to chat with other like-minded people, what you got to do is subscribe and then hit the bell so you'll be notified. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And so, uh, we yeah. do appreciate all ratings and reviews. Please be sure to leave us a rating or review on iTunes as well as YouTube. Ratings actually increase your visibility and allow us to reach a larger audience. Yeah. We accept only the finest quality three to five star reviews. Yes. Very nice. Okay. And uh, here's something that's a little bit new. You can actually support the Great Geeks podcast with little to no effort on your part. It won't cost you anything at all. If you shop Amazon, Dot com, which most everybody does, especially if you've got Amazon Prime, you can use our little affiliate link, and it gives us a small percentage, and it doesn't change your price. It's actually pretty easy to do. There's none of this, hey, let's let's go and, and be a Patreon person and give $5 a month, and you don't have to do any of that stuff. Just use the link, buy something, and move on. Yeah. And it helps uh, keeps our coffee flowing and puts gas in our albino rhino, <laughs> which is our DIY simple camper van, our adventure van. It kind of gets us out there in the business. And that link... If you want to click on it, it is uh, in the show notes below. But if you don't want to do that, you can go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash cheap geek and buy something. And there you go. And like I said, it doesn't change the price and it helps you. Uh, well, it doesn't help you as much as it helps us, but we still appreciate it. So, yeah, that's pretty much. That's all the news and stuff out of the way. Yes. Now we can get into the meat and potatoes of the podcast. Which is? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. And if you listen to us in the past, you know that we like to start off the podcast with basically an interesting random factoid. And we actually have seven what? weird things that you didn't know can be basically insured. Okay. That's a random or, or interesting random factoid. So seven weird things or odd items, right, mm -hmm. that you can have insured. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because somebody we know has recently been rear-ended. And bought a car and been <laughs> rear-ended again. And then somebody else we know has also been rear-ended, so they've been dealing with insurance. Okay. So these are some weird things that you can basically have insured. Okay. Yeah. Beard insurance. Yes, beard insurance. <laughs> if you have a beard and you'd like to have it insured, you can do that. Because it's more than a fashion accessory. It's an iconic thing. And I like how if you read this article and scroll down to the first image – 
ZZ Top. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is that Reverend Meh? Yeah. Is it is that Gibbs? It's Billy Gibbs. Billy Gibbons? Gibbons, yes. Very nice. So, yeah, ZZ Top. He's got his little beard. Reverend Billy. Uh, but the other one I'm interested in, and I'm actually disappointed that it's a joke. So, which is alien abduction insurance. Is that a joke? That's not a joke. That's serious business. Really? It's supposed to be a joke. It was a joke launched in 1987 by the St. Lawrence Agency, based in Florida, of all places, due to the increased hmm. amount of people calling Florida insurance companies asking for alien abduction insurance. Yes. You know, insurance companies don't like to pay out when they, when they have evidence that they have to pay out. How would you even claim that? But... It's like, I'd point. like to file a claim, please. <laughs> I feel that I've been probed and I'm missing time. Yes. But that does, that's a good point. However, the next one is ghost hunting insurance. Because in the Ooh. UK, they do take these paranormal, these unexplained things very seriously. And with the amount of haunted places in Britain, why not offer ghost hunting insurance? Hmm. So... Yeah. Well, they found that a quarter of UK citizens believe in ghosts, and the job of a paranormal investigator is to search the properties for the cause of reported disturbance, right? Mm-hmm. So I can see where they'd want to use the insurance. So I wonder if an insurance company would actually send a paranormal team out to investigate and say yes or no. Well, would you hate to be that team? There's nothing here, man. This actually pr- right? protects the paranormal investigator, though. Oh. So in instances where they run into claims of char I can't say that word, charlatry, fakery. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, it protects them as basically an indemnity. Oh, okay. Yeah. So might be something we look into. <laughs> yeah. Professional indemnity service. Yes. Malpractice insurance against ghost hunters. You get to talk about the Before next ghost one. Hunters. So... <laughs> okay, this next one, I know there's a, a lot of people would like to insure this. It's penis insurance. <laughs> it doesn't protect you against them. It's not an insurance policy against them, I think. I think it's just an insurance policy to protect your penis. Well, maybe it's like a like a business asset. Well, no, they won't yeah, just say, hold on now. They won't just <laughs> insure anybody's penis. It's got to be like a professional penis. <laughs> well, that's what I was saying, like if it's in a certain industry. Yeah. So, yeah. But, and somebody has insured theirs for $1 million. That's a little low. <laughs> I'm thinking I would insure mine for more than that, but that's okay though. <laughs> but it doesn't cover work any work related injury afflicted. So what's it? I don't know. Hmm. Act of God, maybe <laughs> something like that. <laughs> All right, I don't know. We're gonna move on. What number is this? Let's just let's get through this. Sock insurance. In case you can't afford penis yeah. insurance, yep. Get some. Just possibly going to get some sock insurance. Single sock crisis is one of the old, one of the oldest. Uh, man, of, basically, we've all lost socks. So okay. Yeah. Fantasy sports insurance. I could actually see this playing an important role in this digital age. I mean, what? So if you lose your ass playing fantasy football or something? Yeah. So. I still think the penis insurance is more important. <laughs> But this kind of plays into it, the very last one, or near last one, prize indemnity insurance. Participating in competition can be enjoyable, but the loss to a business or individual hosting such an event could be a... uh, Basically, it's a problem. So prize indemnity insurance allows competition organizers to offer high-value rewards to winning competitors without worrying about significant financial loss. So... All right. Yeah. But that's about it. I think those are some very strange things to insure. Yes, seven weird things. So how do you feel about that? Okay. All right, so you feel okay about that? <laughs> yeah. Very, very nice. Okay, so anyway, back to the podcast. And we actually have uh, two very important guests today. Mm-hmm. They've they been make keeping up, quiet this whole time. Yep. Yeah, I forgot to tell them that they could participate. <laughs> One's trying to laugh really quietly, getting all red. Well, it's not so red anymore, I guess. Yeah. Never know. You can't put that much pressure on it something. It was the penile insurance. <laughs> it's penis insurance, sir, not penile insurance. It, it might be two separate things. You might have a higher policy. Plural. <laughs> it might require more uh, more coverage. So, All right, so we're here with the Asheville Cryptid Society, and they've got some stuff they want to talk about, and we've got some stuff we want to talk about. And we figure why not get together and talk about said stuff. Mm-hmm. Right? And to introduce the Asheville Cryptid Society – they're based in Western North Carolina, and they are dedicated to rediscovering lost legends and exploring the spectrum of all life on Earth. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Sounds just as good as the day I wrote it. Yeah, yes. you like that? <laughs> yes, it still sounds good. That sounds pretty important. We so, have to tweak it every once yeah. in a while. 
And we are here with both Christian and Daniel of the Asheville Cryptid Society. So they're going to basically let us interview them. Yes. <laughs> so instead of starting off using like traditional interview questions, we like to ask questions that are a little bit different. Yeah. And since we came from basically from New Mexico, now in, in all disclosure, uh, in all fairness and everything, we're from the East Coast. We're from Virginia. We have family in North Carolina. We've lived here. We moved out to basically New Mexico. Spent four years out there doing a bunch of stuff and weird. finding all the weird, the wacky, all the weird stuff out there. And we thought, okay, there's no other place that can sort of touch New Mexico. Because New Mexico's got some old, weird stuff, man. I mean, it goes way back at well past earlier than the 1200s and stuff. But then we get here, and everybody you talk to has something weird to say, has a weird experience. I mean, this place has concentrated weird, and these are some pretty old mountains out here. Um, so we want to ask you guys, because you guys are pretty much have spent more long-term time here than we have, what makes Western North Carolina so weird? Yeah. Um, probably just a little bit of everything. I mean, it's a, You're supposed to say, well, it's the people. Well, it's, it's definitely the people. It's the people. It's the culture. But, I mean, you're dealing with an area that's had, you know, Native American population for 14,000 years. I mean, Europeans have barely been here 300. So I think all of that time the Native Americans were here, then the Europeans moved in, and then kind of conglomerated together. But, I mean, I, I also believe that because of the age of this area, you know, the Appalachian Mountains are either the first or third oldest mountain chain in the world. Once the geologists get together and figure out who's right, we'll know. But I think all that time has uh, just made this place one of the weirdest, strangest, unique areas you can imagine. I can't even, I mean, Tiny's from here. So, I, um, excuse me, I call Daniel Tiny. Uh, Daniel's from this area. So, he was raised here, and I, I think... It's just in the culture. I think some of the weirdness, uh, they're just more open to uh, paranormal and cryptid behaviors or, or belief systems. I think a lot of it is is the personal connection that people have with the land. Hmm. Yeah. I know I actually grew up in, in eastern Tennessee. That piece of land that I grew up on, I had such a, a personal deep connection with that I still feel it. And not being there... It feels weird. I know a lot of people still in this area that, that have those connections with the lands, those familial ties that go back for generations on top of generations. It's just, I think it's bred in. Do you think it's not just that tie to the land, but also the types of folklore that, because when I talk to you, you know, off podcasts and things like that, you are a great storyteller and you are also pretty good at like telling a little bit about the folklore, which I know nothing about here. Thank you. Do you think it's that variance in folklore that makes this place weird? Well, there is definitely a variety of folklore here, and people take it very seriously. I mean, the first thing you told us about was Helen's Bridge. Yes. But then, like, the next conversation we have is puck wedgies. Yes. So <laughs> there, there is. They uh, are delicious. <laughs> yes. You know, With butter. Fat. Yeah. yeah. A little grizzly. Well, I'm probably saying it wrong, so. No, oh, it's well. puck <laughs> There, between the, the native culture that, that has been here for centuries, for so, so, so long, and the mountain culture that have been here, and everything's integrated. You know, you have hoodoo practitioners from back in the back in the hills, you know, what some of us call barefoot hillabilly boys, <laughs> you know, which is, is my family. Just deep roots, hmm. deep beliefs and it's that belief that in, intention in that belief that make everything so great and i do think that's a little different from us in the southwest where each culture kind of tucked itself away and had grew its own traditions yeah so you know we had the strong uh mexican influence but then you have a strong native influence catholicism sat someplace in the middle in all its variances yeah, spanish yeah <laughs> But here it seems like you can believe in puckwudgies, but you can also believe in hoodoo. Yes. That type of thing. It all goes in. Paranormal, correct me if I'm wrong, paranormal is an umbrella term. It encompasses so much, and there's no harm in believing a lot of it. I've seen so many weird things in my life, not just, you know, with m &D Paranormal, not just paranormal, ghost spirits, things like that, but... I saw what I'm convinced is 
a fairy or a troll or something once. I almost wrecked when I saw it. So hmm. there's a lot of things out there. And that kind of goes. Could have been a groundhog. <laughs> Swamp gas. Yeah. That could that kind of yeah. goes into our next question for each of you, like separately. What would be your most interesting experience here in Western North Carolina? Like which one was more significant for you? Or Ooh. yeah. Um And uh, it doesn't even have to be something where like we want evidence, but like what what personal experience did you have that really Well we I've been kinda lucky because I've had, you know, several with my team, but I think the one that really kind of spooked me the most was when I got lost. Uh, we we were doing a, a, a decrypted tour, um, and we were getting a map ready to go. We were going to go to different places where people had seen, you know, Bigfoot, Dog Band, Puck Wudgies, Water Spears, things like that. Hmm. And um, I, I got completely taken off road. I mean, I was I was way out there. Uh, I was so far out in the sticks that my radio, in my car didn't work. Oh. The phone wasn't working. I mean, and to make matters worse, I have a like a little compass on my dashboard. It just sat there and spun. I mean, it was like. What was, area or region were you in? I was not far from Hot Springs. Okay. And I just kept going, and I, I was on this fire road. I'm thinking it was a fire road, cause I, but the grass was like, you know, almost coming up to my hood. And I was just idling along. I was afraid just, there were, I had no room to back up, because one side was basically a cliff, and the other one was just like a 70-foot drop. Hmm. So there was just barely enough room to get by. And I, like I said, I'm just idling along. And I heard this massive howl to the point where it shook the inside of my chest. With I had the windows up and the door closed, obviously. But, and then I looked out the window real quick and I saw like a black flash. Mm-hmm. And that's enough to get the heart <clears throat> pumping. Because, uh, you know, you have no idea where you are. You have no phone signal. And here's the other thing I did. I had told nobody what I was doing. No one had any idea where I was, what I was doing. My wife had flown to Florida to see her relatives. Um, it was a Sunday. There was nothing going on. I figured to myself, <laughs> I'll go be the smart guy. Get, I broke every cryptozoological rule you can do about investigating alone. Yeah. Later, I filled up the gas tank. If you read... Uh, uh, David Paulini's oh, yeah, or no. Missing 411. I'm a huge Missing you're, 411 fan. And you're I'm sitting there. turning yourself into a Missing oh, 411 yeah. I, was, I was honestly going to pull over and write a note to my wife <laughs> telling her I loved her and I'm yeah. sorry, but I'm thinking to myself, they're never going to find me. Yeah. And then I keep driving down this, this road and the grass started getting a little shorter, but no one had been on. I mean, you could see it, obvious. Mm-hmm. And then I look at my rear view mirror and I see this. I, I always describe it as like a pillar. Uh, but it was like a probably a 10 or 11 foot section of a tree just go flying like off of a hill I see I just saw it in the rearview mirror and it just boom 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 and I'm hearing that and then I heard that roar again and then it's when I started doing the Hail Marys because I thought that was it checking out <laughs> see you game over and I had just had shoulder uh, shoulder surgery so I wasn't even in I mean that to boot that I mean I'm, I'm not even a hundred percent. I'm out there doing this, and I'm, I have—I don't have the reuse of my right arm, so I'm just putting along here. And then I see another black flash, like down in front, and I have no idea what's going on. I'm—I'm I'm at this point, I was really kind of freaking out, uh, and I—I I just kept creeping along. And then I came to this part of the the road where it was like the grass was maybe seven eight inches high, but it was—it was like a lot flatter, and it was—it had cleared out. And about 20 yards in front of me is this bear. And this bear is just sitting there. And he's look, I'm honking the horn. I'm, like, trying to get him off the road. And he just, he could have cared less. I mean, he honestly looked at me like, what the hell are you going to do? I mean, that's, that was that was the, the feeling I got. So I'm trying to figure out what to do here because I don't want to, like, hit the bear with my car. And then he's going to, like, jump on the hook, you know, do all this stuff. And I was worried about getting stranded there. And I saw the bear look up, like, straight up. His ears go up, and they kind of do that little radar thing where they go one way, and he starts sniffing the air, and he looks over me, over like to my left shoulder, and he bails. He's gone. Yeah. He's a flash. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, okay, that was pretty, pretty cool. You know, just I'll just keep going. So I go about another 45 yards, and there's this log in the road. Like an obstruction. Like an obstruction. Intentional like obstruction. Like an intentional obstruction. And, you know, I drive a Subaru, 
And I, that, that my car was pretty good over good, but there's just no way it was going to go over this. Mm-hmm. And if I, I was thinking to myself, if I go over this, am I going to break a ra- break an axle, puncture my radiator, or something's going to happen? So I make the decision to get out and move it. Now again, I've got my right arm in sling. I do have a 357 Magnum with me, hmm. but I have to put that down <laughs> to move the log. So I'm trying to move this log, and it's like the grass had grown over it and all this other stuff. So I actually had to take the time. I had to take my pocket knife out and kind of cut the grass a little bit to get it moving. Meanwhile, all this is happening. My head's on a swivel. I'm terrified because I don't know what's out there. And something had just thrown a log and scared this bear off because I know it wasn't me. And I found it, I managed to get the log out of the way, and I just keep going. And eventually I came out uh, in Tennessee, which was not where I had started. I actually started in North Carolina. Yeah. And I came out in this old camping ground, and it was really, honestly, it looked like something from the 70s, like the way this camp has been set up. There's like these old buses over in the corner with tarps on them. And I just drove a, another little bit, and I came upon a grandfather's two kids, and he was having them, he was fishing with them. And I asked him, I got in my car and said, excuse me, sir, I kind of got turned around. Can you tell me where I am? He goes, yeah, you're in Tennessee. And I said, what's the easiest way to get back to North Carolina? Yeah. <laughs> and before he answers me, he yells at his kid, Hey, boy, get out of them woods. You know there's boogers in there. Oh. And the okay. whole time he's saying that, I'm just sitting there like this. I'm going for my, you know, my cigar. I'm mm. like, <laughs> a little nicotine fit at that point. But uh, that was probably the, the, the most scary was alone. Uh, we've had other events where we've actually, uh, you know, run into a dog man. But that, that was pretty – at that point, I, I did not feel like I was on top of the food chain. We had similar stuff, and it, it's funny that – the story you give is very similar to our experiences in a in a supposedly Sasquatch heavy area of New Mexico, which is called Jimez Springs. Mm-hmm. And yeah, same we had thing. no idea it was very narrow road. The Sasquatch other side's heavy, like we a very at long ravine, <clears throat> and we were crossing into the more far off territory built by CCC, which means uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps. They built the old campgrounds. We were heading into that territory when. All of a sudden, a very large black bear crosses in front of us, bolting it, terrified. Mm -hmm. And then not long after that, we had two large cattle, because in New Mexico, you let your cattle roam in national forests. Interesting. And they took off as well. And we didn't understand what would be so large that it would terrify a a black bear and two, a bull and a, I guess, the next, you know, in the alpha of cow packs, <laughs> a very large female, yeah. you know, but it was like, what would the scare? Not the well, yeah, because they have very similar dynamic, you know, you have the, the boss. Yeah. The boss yeah. lady. And that's what she was. Boss lady bull. Yeah. Shot collar. Yeah. Mm. But I mean, f- three very large creatures running in fear of their lives. Well, when that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't think people understand when like you actually see a, bear, I mean, a, a black bear, I mean, those are big, Yeah. but when it's, sitting there and it you, it doesn't care you're there yeah i mean it, it, there was absolutely no and this is carolina yeah. where they're sitting on people's front porches exactly. yes it just, it, <laughs> eating dominoes and you know the sad thing is honestly it wasn't even sitting and like pizza hut yeah it was it was dumpsters all locked up <laughs> pizza, you ever, pizza. You ever seen how yeah. a dog just kind of leaves like sometimes like this and it's kind of like being lazy it's just like it's about to sleep mm-hmm. that's what his bear was looking like it just didn't care it wasn't even sitting right it looks like it was going to take a nap and i was going to have to wait for it to move <laughs> it knew it wasn't in the public eye no <laughs> <laughs> he just, it did not care. And then all of a sudden, within two, boom, it's gone. Yeah. And it's like, how fast? I, I still can't believe how fast that thing could move. <clears throat> but, oh, they move fast. Yeah, that, I mean, that guy could book. But, uh, yeah, that was that was a little terrifying. Hmm. But for me, that was that was probably, again, I broke every rule. David Pilates, I was waiting to be on his missing 411 next yeah. book. It would have been called Stupidity <laughs> by Crypt Investigator. <laughs> what not to do, the Christian McLeod story. <laughs> Well, you do know that's like kind of the underlying tone for a lot of that, though. Oh yeah, well, four one one. But you know what's funny is like if you know me and you like you, you hear my team, I am so I make sure everyone knows where they're going. Everyone's yeah. got a firearm. Everyone's certified. Everyone's got maps. Everyone's just, and I'm so like by the book about doing it the right way. And then my hypocrisy knows no end. I go out <laughs> and break every rule. Like I didn't even have a candy bar with me. I mean, I could have been stranded there. I, you know. Eating taco sauce packets yeah, you to do survive. That, do that in New Mexico. Hot yeah. mustard. That's how you wind up dead <laughs> yeah, quick out there in New Mexico. So, but, uh, and then. Daniel. Daniel. Well, I think one of the 
more interesting experiences I've had here in North Carolina actually was at work. Um, you know, I've been in healthcare for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I was working long term care at a particular place. And if you don't believe in the paranormal, go work long term care. You will. <laughs> Uh, this particular instance, one of my uh, residents had passed, and I was doing post-mortem care. And this particular resident was known to have not been the best person in younger years. Oh, okay. And honestly, in elder years, wasn't much better. Hmm. Um, and now, do you mean like shady history or just not a... Kind, just a bad, wonderful person. Bad person. Yeah, not a not a kind person. Okay. Uh, in particular, to her stepdaughter. Oh. Who is the only one that ever came visit her? Believe it or not. Huh. But um, she had passed, and it, I was doing post mortem. And the minute that I stepped in that room, when I crossed that threshold, it was like the weight of the world caved in on me oh i've never felt anything like it and i've dealt with some nasty stuff over the years i immediately got vertigo Mm -hmm. immediately got a headache it's like somebody turned me upside down and squeezed my brain and it was as soon as i crossed that threshold the entire time that i'm doing post-mortem care i'm feeling sick Mm mm-hmm a little bit nauseated, very, very dizzy. The The vertigo did not leave until about 15 minutes after I left the room. And I felt a presence in that room. I felt a presence more powerful than I have ever been in the presence of hmm. in that room. I don't know what had come to escort this lady wherever she was going, but I don't want to meet it again. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were... We've been looking more into some of the paranormal stuff, thanks to you guys. And one of the interesting tidbits I've heard about postmortem care in hospitals, as, as well as hospices, is it true you have to leave a door or a window cracked? It's, it's best to, yes. So it's kind of an old wives thing that's kind of turned into a tradition? Yes, yeah. Did you do that? Yeah. During that instance? Yeah. Okay. Um, and there was, it's kind of like with smudging. Mm-hmm. You want to leave an exit. Okay. Hmm. hmm. But and that's just one of so many stories I have. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think with what I've noticed hanging out with you guys in the paranormal, um, some of these instances that are just so heavy and so intense, usually you can't rec- rec- uh, recollect or that vertigo or the mm-hmm. other symptoms that you experience during that phenomenon mm-hmm. cause you to not have a clear perspective on what happened to you do you feel that happened to you as well during that time no okay no honestly and i think that's probably because of past experiences okay um it was it was incredibly intense Mm -hmm. but i've experienced intensity before so once it, it it was a shock when it happened but once it happened i could deal with it and kind of understand what was going on Hmm. and just because, and let me clarify this too. Just because something is intense or heavy, doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's it's strong. Whatever was in that room was incredibly powerful. And I don't think it was a ghost. I don't think it was her spirit. I think something came to escort this lady. Okay, she passed. A reaper kind of thing. Something like that. Yeah, I, I don't know what it may have been, but I think it was an escort, hmm. and it was it was strong. Hmm. And I know you argue or want to stress the point that it's not necessarily a negative or positive, yes. but do you feel, because I kind of feel this way, when you expose yourself to an intense presence, when it tries to influence you or affect you, is that not negative? Not necessarily. Okay. The The influence could simply be something saying, hey, I'm here, okay. or you need to pay attention. You could kind of go along with the harbinger theory you know these things are influencing people because something's about to happen not necessarily because they're causing it to happen but it could be saying watch out okay you know in this particular case there wasn't an influence it was just there um now i I have bled because of something that was unseen 
twice in my life. That was definitely negative. <laughs> <laughs> but and it, and it's funny because that that you know that goes from the paranormal straight into kind of the cryptid world where there seems to be a phenomenon where when that cryptid or that unknown entity is within your presence or range, the environment as well as yourself seems to change. I've noticed in certain cryptid sightings, one of the key aspects is it was dead silent or birds I should have heard during this time of year. I didn't hear them. Yeah, even the insects stop, everything. Yeah. 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 It's like a a warning. Everything wants to be quiet because it doesn't want to be a part of whatever's going to happen. That's terrible <laughs> theory well there's a theory that like it, it puts out this cryptid whatever it may be say it's bigfoot or dogman puts out like a pheromone okay so it's and a pheromone a, again it's a theory okay. who knows well because the other but it makes sense yeah the other one i've heard because i've actually experienced this i have yet to have a significant cryptid sighting but i have been in the vicinity <clears throat> of crypt, cryptid sightings where there's a theory of the sound bubble where um, once you are within this creature's uh, radius or range, yeah. um, it, it's not a pheromone. It's emitting something. It's an infrasound. Causes, yeah, an infrasound. It's a frequency between 15 yeah. hertz. Yeah, it, and it and goes, and it, you just, it, it's what high uh, end predators use. Tigers use it. Elephants use it to communicate over long distances. And what it does, it, it just messes with your head. It can make you dizzy. It can make you faint. Um, that happened to me one time, and I actually put in my earbuds because hmm. I'd always prepared for something like that. Yeah. And it made me feel better. But realistically, what most people say they go through it, it takes a, a, a whole sleep revolution for it to go away completely. And that's very true. <laughs> yeah, because you can wear yeah. earbuds, but with infrasound, it's yeah. it's such the frequency. Hearing is the least yeah. of your worries when it comes to that sort of thing. And once the frequency it's hits like, you, it it's, it's almost like low-frequency sonar. It can kill you. You know, yeah. uh, the sound waves, the frequency, the duration, all that stuff. Which is definitely have a negative effect. Good to go so. cryptid hunting or hiking with a dog. <laughs> no, actually, dogs. You know, they're they're more onto it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Than, than most uh, cryptid investigators I know. I mean, most people I know they just go out alone. But if if I had a dog that I trusted, like yeah. I've always wanted a German Shepherd, but if I had a, a dog that I trusted to go out in the woods and not you know go out attacking something or get chased or whatever, <laughs> that'd be the perfect you know companion. But realistically, most. Uh, most stories that I've heard where that, that happens, like someone, it's always a couple camping or they're sleeping in a tent or something like that. It's always the woman that's alerted first. It's like, I think there's just something about women have that extra sense. They know trouble's coming. And the, the sense extra it. sensitivity of the hearing helps yeah. them see colors. We can't. <laughs> Stop. Apparently, it's, <laughs> apparently it's in the purple spectrum. But then what I'm understand. at a disadvantage because <clears throat> I got the worst hearing ever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, hey, you're listening to the Creep Geeks Podcast. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we will be right back. The goal of m and Paranormal is to compassionately, knowledgeably, and professionally support and offer paranormal services to those who have been affected by a paranormal experience, including those who have been indirectly affected. Services provided include paranormal investigation, property research, and evidence review of residential, business, and private property locations. Cleansing of these properties are available upon request. No matter the circumstances of the paranormal experience, MD Paranormal strive to offer a non judgmental environment to promote education, open communication, and empathy to each individual that chooses to share their experience or come into our service. In achieving this goal, MD Paranormal is building and bringing together a community of open and like minded individuals by offering free monthly gatherings and events at the Shop Eclectic, 49 State Street, Marion, North Carolina. Call us anytime at 828 484 1637 or 828 559 2818 or email us at MD Paranormal. And we're back. So when we talk about different things when it comes to the, the, the weird, the wacky, the wild, the wonderful, the spooky, the paranormal stuff, um, a lot of people uh, lump it all into one sort of category. And that's kind of how we look at it. You know, we, we like this sort of thing. We talk about this kind of thing. And we don't have one particular favorite over another. Well, I mean, I, I kind of do. But it's all interesting, right? And we've always thought that it's all interesting. We, and we've 
we've always sort of looked at it sort of you know, the whole open eye for everything. And so we, when we decided to kind of take this show on the road, if you will, and look at different things and start videotaping and doing all this stuff, doing more active investigations, one of the things we've noticed is that it seems like a lot of people are specialized and they only want to stay specialized in whatever particular field they're interested in, and they sort of discount or disprove other like fields of study, if you will, <laughs> right? And one thing that I've noticed with a couple of groups around here is that it, it's not just all one or nothing. It seems like there's a little bit of you know a mix. Like people will like alien stuff. Some people like cryptid stuff. Some people like paranormal ghosty type stuff. Some people like woo-woo stuff. Um but when you have a, a team that sort of like puts that sort of thing together where you can do like ghosts or paranormal and encrypted stuff, I, I just think you get a better viewpoint. I mean, w- with everything, because you have a different type of skepticism. You know, if you're, if you're just a, a pure sort of cryptid investigator and somebody said, hey, did you see the alien, you know, over there and this and that? Oh, well, you know, the circle that you see in the field has been burned in there or the, where the reeds have been pushed down or whatever. No, that's just this. And it, well, the point of the whole thing is, is that I think you get a better view and a better idea and a better sort of um, story behind the stuff that you see in the woods or in the sky or, or wherever. If you can bring those different skill sets, whether you're just a cryptid person or a paranormal person or whatever, and you bring it all together, because, you know, I might see, you know, a, a push down area in the reeds or in the grasses being, oh, that's where a craft sat down. And maybe the tripod foot from the 1950s UFO that everybody <laughs> sees has pushed it down. Whereas you might see it as being, no, that's where something bedded down. That's a Bigfoot nest. Yeah. Like you know, the Pacific and so Northwest. I kind of like seeing it. And it seems like for a while there, a lot of the shows that you watch on television were sort of like, let's keep everything separate. Yeah. And I think that you're going to start seeing more shows with a sort of blending of all that stuff together. So. Well, that's the only way it's going to continue to work. Is yeah, the it's, it's you, the only way it can, really. You, you can't be an individual out there that just says there's just this one thing. Like, most people, if they're being honest with each other or if they're being honest with themselves, cryptid research and paranormal research go hand in hand. Yeah. Usually when there's one, there's Even the a lot of the gear exactly. that you use. So I don't understand why people, <laughs> well, you know. you know, we, use, we usually use the tri-field meters. I usually use those in the woods because, you know, my personal theory on that is that Dogman or Bigfoot puts out so much energy because of the size – It'll probably trip on a meter, and I actually used to. I actually had some pretty good hmm. luck uh, finding a few bears. Uh, we'd be in the woods, and I'd, I'd set the meter to some, and every once in a while, I'd see the needle tick, and lo and behold, there'd be something back there. It okay. was pretty good hmm. size. Here's a skeptic question, though: Was mm-hmm. the bear tagged? I, I honestly do not know. It's okay. very possible. Right. Uh, very possible. Well, that's a good question. I, I did not see a collar, <laughs> but it's it's. Well, possible. no, I, I could actually oh, yeah. see that because if you look at like different things that we used to use. Anyway, back in my military days, we had magnetic anomaly detectors, and you know they look for magnetic anomalies in the water, and you could pick up a whale because mm-hmm. it has a it's a, such a huge animal that its lines of influence, its magnetic lines of flux, all of that are much larger, and they radiate more than say a you know a fish. So, <laughs> I agree. Just because the physical size, I mean, it, you know, kind of makes sense. And well, plus, that, that was using that meter, you could see ley lines and where you know geo and magnetic influence would happen because you know magnetism is nature's magic. So I could totally see using something like that out there. Well, it works. And, and again, I, and it's like you said earlier, you know, when you have a group of individuals, Tiny is much more apt at the paranormal. And it's not because he's been doing it longer. It's because he's gifted. I've seen him go into a room and entities clear out. I've, I've seen it. I've, I mean, they're, he's like a natural repellent of what I like to call the not nice entities. Very just, tall smudge stick. He yes. is. He's, he's a very tall smudge. That, yes, that's, that's excellent. It also makes it a little more difficult to investigate. It does. But, I mean, it's, it's, but he's, he was born that way. That's the way, you know, God made him. So he's just a natural, you know, I guess, antenna for that kind of thing. I've been very lucky because, you know, I've been doing this for 23 years, and I've, I've had some training, and I know what to look for in the woods every once in a while. I'll see something that doesn't, you know, look right. And we've been lucky with some of the stuff we've seen. But realistically, I always like other people's input, too, because, you know, you're right. One guy's looking at one thing. I'm looking, maybe this is a Bigfoot track. Maybe it's a nest. Maybe it's something else. Tiny can look at it and say, well, you know, paranormally, that could be this. Or, you know, it could be a natural occurring phenomena, you know. Or, or uh, there's been instances where we've been in the woods, um, the Bermuda Triangle. We always give stuff a different name so people don't really know where we're 
looking because a lot of times where we go, we don't want people to go there, one, because it's a hot spot, or two, someone has got the potential to get hurt. But there was uh, one place in particular we found, 30 or 60 uh, foot circle. They looked like it came down from the trees and just burnt everything as it came down. Now, I just happen to have a radiation detector with me. And okay. Why do you just happen to have a radiation detector with you? I like to be prepared. I just happen to have a Geiger counter. I did. I happen to have a Geiger counter with me. Boy Scout. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> What kind of was... Boy Scout carries a Geiger counter? Maybe one well, from New Mexico, actually. Well, <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Um, from around Chernobyl. Yeah. Uh, we, we do a lot of interesting work. And uh, it was actually five or six points higher in that area than anything else. So you never know what you're going to find. And as soon as you walked out of that circle, it Mm -hmm. dropped. Yeah, it's gone. Dead on that that line, it dropped. Mm -hmm. It was the weirdest thing. But, you know, that's just another case of what could that be? You know, uh, frankly, personally, me, I I think it was possibly a UFO. Hmm. But it could have been anything else. See, I would go the other way and say it's entirely possible that one of our military craft, because we're in in this area Mm -hmm. where we have a ton of military, dropped something like maybe a flare. Because we do have flares that very luminous and phosphoresce. But would that be that sort a of completely circular area? I it mean, can be. Yeah. Perfectly circular? Sure. Would it? I mean, it's very possible. But again, yeah. who am I to say what it was? I don't know. I didn't see it. I saw what was left of whatever was there. And that's when it's good to have like someone like Dan around and you know other people on our team. Because there's other ideas and stuff. You know, What could this possibly be? Military application? I'll be honest with you. I never thought of that, Greg. That's actually oh, yeah. a flare. That makes total sense. Yeah. But... Again, it was a perfect circle. I would have checked the night before for meteor showers or anything in the air that night. I mean, that's possible too. But the way it was, uh, like, it was just a perfect circle all the way down. Yep. I mean, you could see tree branches that had been there was, blown out. Yeah, there was also yeah. like you could tell it was older because there was new growth trying to come back in. Okay. So I don't think it was anything the night before. I think it had happened probably a year or two past, and okay. that was yeah. still evidence of i mean it. who knows you know it's kind of one of those things where if, if you get enough differ if you get enough different people with different ideas about things you definitely get a lot more um because i've seen the ideas circular asteroid and, and meteor. that's kind of what i like i like when there's so many different people with different viewpoints because then once you can start discounting all these other viewpoints and it gets the amount of information gets narrowed to the point where you're only left with like, well, hell, I don't know what that is. You know what I mean? And that's what I want. I don't, I hate when you see like somebody will say, this is it. Oh, I can't stand that. You know, it's like, okay, well, hold on a second. Cause I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. It could be this. It could be this. It could be this. And, and they the don't, they don't put them out there like cryptid that. You know? Expert. Yeah. Like who, I love it when they go, who, yes, who's I'm an a expert. Cryptid. No one's an expert. It's like, I'm an, I mean, how can you be an expert at something? I mean, if you came cruising out of the woods with, Something that nobody's ever seen before or has proven, you know, like you come out of the woods holding a, a crying baby Bigfoot or Sasquatch, right? <laughs> Sasquatch. Yeah, his little Sasquatch. Sam and says, hey, Bibiscus look what I found. <laughs> I would call you a, crypt- a cryptozoological expert. But until then, we're all just speculating about what, what we hear, what we or see. if you're riding a dog man. You ride a dog yeah. man out of the woods yeah. with a baby Sasquatch, I'm saying you're pretty good. I wouldn't call you an expert unless, unless you said. Unless I found out you birthed the Sasquatch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Great minds think a lot. You did that the birthing. Is, that is gross. <laughs> if you were there to catch, yes. if you are an expert. Did you cut the cord? <laughs> but see, I mean, that's just that it, though. And, and there's so many. Oh. I, and I think that's, that's where part of, like, people have problem with the groups, right? Where one group will look at another group, whether it's paranormal, cryptid, whatever it is, and they'll, you know, one will look at the other like, oh, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, or one will look at the other and go, okay, they don't know what they're doing, but we need to compete. You know, we need, and a lot of that is, it's like, okay, if you call yourself, for example, a paranormal expert, if you're doing it, and this is the way I look at it personally, if you're calling yourself a paranormal expert and you're not recognized by other paranormal experts, experts as being a paranormal then you're not a, an expert right but if you're out there and you're you're proclaiming you are a paranormal expert self-proclaimed yeah and then you meet another group of people they may just know more than you right and then that makes them a little little uncomfortable with it so then they got to try to prove themselves or what they'll do is they'll try to discount the other group is like oh well they don't know what they're doing because i'm doing this that's the kind of garbage that needs to kind of go away because if you look really look at it and i've said this a couple different times Everybody looks like a bunch of nut jobs 
out in the woods looking for stuff that doesn't exist, walking through houses that doesn't. I mean, yeah, but we look good. So doing it's a great. It. Well, you think you look good. <laughs> no, we look good because there's good. other people looking in, going, "What are these nut jobs doing?" Out Besides looking good. <laughs> so, again, that's all speculative, man. Yeah, he's got a point. Yeah, but and see, and here's where it gets to be. I think can be fixed. Because, like, we want to be a part of all this, and we've said that we want to be a part of all this sort of thing. I think there needs to be a sort of a standard. You know, agree. That's yeah. our dog Pepper protecting us from probably the wind. So she's upset about something. Um, or we have visitors. Dunk, dunk, dunk. But I think there needs to be sort of a standard. And if you are a cryptid investigator, a paranormal investigated, uh, investigator, and you use the same sort of methods for investigation, and you make that a sort of a standard thing, whether it's the material that you use, how you set up, it's where you, it becomes more, I don't know, legit. And using those same methods, man, that, that's got to do, well, I would think, make things a lot better for the skeptics looking in or somebody looking in from the outside going, you guys are a bunch of nuts. But there's jobs. a group that does that. I was just thinking. Well, yeah, the, it's the Navajo Rangers. Yes, because no matter what, because they are official rangers by law, they have to use the same breakdown of every situation, yeah. every scene, because they have to treat it like a crime scene. And plus, they have to write those reports, and yeah. so that's how they do it. And so that's kind of what I'm looking at. The good thing about having a group that's like a, a blended group that does like say cryptid stuff and ghosty stuff and whatever, if 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 all that's happening and the same sort of criteria is being used, it just standardizes your results, mm-hmm. and it should well, take the, that whole you know sort of ambiguity out of it. The thing is, is the the parasciences all go together you know there yeah. there's when you're out bigfoot hunting there's a certain amount of of mysticism that goes with it because there's so much lore that goes along with bigfoot you need to know that but there's a lot of instances where orbs have been seen around bigfoot okay so what are orbs are they ufos are they ghosts are they some sort of ectoplasm yeah are they you know yeah, some sort of light that bigfoot is manifesting with his mind who knows we don't know we're not experts right yeah. but you've got to combine all of that it goes hand in hand there's no competition see i think we've just been Shouldn't doing be. we, we've been doing the team thing so long and it's such a strange mix because you know i'm more crypt i do paranormal research too don't get me wrong i'm a big fan of that but tiny's better apted towards that and you know i'm more along the lines of the cryptid world but, you know, we've been doing it together as a team for so long. I mean, I, I just always assumed everyone would do what we do. And, again, it's, it's like we said earlier. Yeah, no, it's like no they don't. Well, I, and, and it's <laughs> sad because, you know, we've been at events. Um, we were at an event not too long ago. Uh, we were at an event not too long ago, I guess, what, six months ago. And people were looking at us like we were crazy mm-hmm. because we were presenting information together. They're like, yeah. what, what's the cryptic guy doing with the ghost guy? What's wrong? It's yeah, like we are breaking some kind of rule. And, you know, <laughs> we've noticed that, too. And one of the things that was uh, we thought was really funny was um, way back in 2012. Yeah. When the Paranormal Ranger guys, because they actually talked about this one time, when they started doing their thing and they were doing a talk somewhere, I think it was in Scotland or somewhere like that, um, somewhere in Europe. You know, they were asked, you know, why do, why were you guys investigating everything? Because they couldn't understand why, you know, they were investigating. Because they would. They would investigate, like, paranormal stuff, Bigfoot stuff, UFO stuff, whatever it was, Skinwalker stuff. For, you know, um, And so to them it was all the same as well, right? They just implemented the same sort of method of, of cataloging and, and, and making sure the information was good. But other people would talk to them and go, you know, why were you doing, you know, they couldn't wrap their heads around the idea that these guys were doing all of it. But it's also so. to speak upon, I guess, the the belief system of those people because they're Navajo. So it is all tied together. UFOs exist. Big well, yeah, for exists. them. But I mean, for the for the yeah. people that they were talking to over in Europe, they were just, it's they couldn't they couldn't see why or how they were doing it all together. I mean, and then they were trying to discount what they would say. Because it's been so Because they were doing it all together. They're like, wait a minute, you're not yeah. a true ghost expert because you also investigate everything else. But well, I think you know, a lot And of the reason why they too. had to do it all together, because it was a, it was a very small team of two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, they had I've to cover actually, like 30,000 square yeah. miles of, of you know, Navajo yeah. land to basically go and see. And so you know, yeah. they just did it all. Because these guys could talk about everything from Bob Bigelow and Bigelow uh, Aerospace to basically talking to... You know, the Chiefs. Yeah. 
So. Well, one of the things, too, that, that make especially paranormal research so difficult is, yeah, we have tools that we can use. Yeah, they're all flawed because oh, yeah. it's it's a – we're still building on that research. We're researching for a reason because we don't know. But with the paranormal, your your gut comes into play so much more than any of the instrumentation that we use. It's based on a feeling, a knowledge – that you have and a lot of that you know transfers over to bigfoot hunting too because when you're out there you're going to feel it oh yeah you'll you know. see it it's always a gut yeah. instinct like every time we do something and it's hard to prove your gut instinct yeah. because you're the one having it right you're not having yeah, yeah. my gut instinct so you don't know you know what's going on with me yeah. right but you know you got a good team member when you both have the same feeling at the same time or you're or, in trouble you know, or you're in trouble <laughs> which has happened yeah. like what's because i mean there's yeah. levels of instinct right and yeah that's the one thing, too, is like you should always trust your gut. The problem with a lot of that is is that when you're a little kid and you're growing up, your parents basically make you discount your gut. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, like a little kid will tell you if somebody's weird and they don't want to be around them. Yeah. And what, what do parents do? Oh, no, you need to not judge that person. You need to. And I get all that. Exactly. But at the same time, if a little kid says there's something wrong with you. Probably something wrong. And wants to stay away from you, <laughs> there probably is something wrong, you know. But we, we sort of sort of temper that away. From them, you know, whereas you get some people that, you know, that, that their instincts are way well more heightened, you know. So mm-hmm. we're trained out of so many abilities yeah. that we're born with. Yeah. If we're out in the woods and you just see somebody just take off running, I'm not going to ask them why they're running. I'm just going to run too. Exactly. You know, it's like, why is he running? You know, no, just go. Don't be last. No. <laughs> Heck no. That should be so. the new t shirt on the back. <laughs> Don't, Don't be, be last. last. Yeah. I just got to run faster than you. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I don't have to be faster than you. I just have to be faster than the slowest person, right? <laughs> Which is going to be me. So I'm just going to go save yourselves. But see, and save and that, yourselves. That yeah. is a little bit of a difference between you guys and us. I am just, I'm less afraid of nature and natural phenomenon. But as far as like paranormal, ghosty stuff, we are on the same level. So we've had experiences where we've been camping and there's been something strange. I'm the one that wants to stay all night and like have a ghillie suit on and a camera. And he's the one packing up with our older dog, Ben. It's like, yeah, get we gotta go. <laughs> I'm not getting my arm stripped out of my socket and stuffed up in a tree yeah. because everybody thinks that Sasquatch is a nice fella. He's not. And he's not. One he's, of the, no way, man. One of the things that go I, right now, you're doing the right thing. Heck yeah, man. One, one of the things I tell people and you're going to appreciate this on me. Mm-hmm. I will be the one to find definitive proof of Bigfoot. You know what I'm talking about. And this is how it's going to happen. Me and Christian are going to be in the woods. We're going to be looking for Bigfoot. We're going to come across Bigfoot. You're going to fight Bigfoot? I'm not going to fight Bigfoot. I'm going to go try and shake his hand and pet him. And the last thing you'll hear on the video is, Tiny, stop. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Yeah. And then you're going to see either. Why is he looking at you like that? (laughs) Exactly. And then you're going to see either me riding his back, yelling, get this on video because I can't let go. Or me being flung across the woods. One of the two, but it'll still be definitive proof. Famous last words, here, hold my K2. Exactly. <laughs> or, hey, y'all, watch this. Yeah. Hey, you got That's this on blurry t-shirt. camera? <laughs> hey, get my blurry camera ready. That's really what it is. Christian, put this on the GoPro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it what it is. Get, get that faux pro. Get that faux get, exactly. get the cheap GoPro. Oh, no. I mean, I don't know. I've actually thought about what would I do if I seen Bigfoot. And I would react the same way I'd react if I seen a bear. I wouldn't. I would just basically stand there and have this thing look at me, and I would look at it and see what happens. Hmm. There's really, I mean, honestly, because if, if, if I'm not a threat, then I'm not a threat. That's the thing. If it don't, so. if, if it's not, if it's not scary. But hold on, though. I do have an, a, 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 a basically a strategy if I have to evacuate the area quickly. So, if you know, I see or hear the Bigfoot, I will check my surroundings, right, and make sure that my exit is clear. And then I will turn the key in my car and drive away. Because <laughs> so. the alternative is is to release the viscous brown fluid <laughs> that's stored deep inside your body that you can release in case of extreme emergency. I don't think you'd have time. So. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. I think I don't there know. is this thing called explosive uh, diarrhea, <laughs> and it may become a thing. You never know. It might be like it might you know. It might like that. It might like it. It, it might, might slip in it. Those big feet slipping around. It might put it in its fur. It's going to be like a gel. Rub the lotions oh. on its back. Oh. Keep well, I mean, the flies is that, away. Gross. Is that why they smell bad? Is because they rub the poo of their victims on them? It's I, very possible. I think they just <laughs> smell bad because they're a damn animal living out in the woods and they don't take baths that often. Oh. Well, there's there's a 
theory. Right. Probably they grow like have so scent glands too. There's um, gross. There's different scent glands. Um, there's allegedly a th- document that came out uh, about a, a doctor. That I actually had a copy of it. I don't have it with me right now, but. So would they uh, be like ape-like scent glands? Like they were ape-like, they? yeah, they were ape-like scent glands, but uh, the, the apparently there was three different species. There's like the paddy type, there's the type 2, and then there's like the nienerthal type. The type 2 is more around this area, mm-hmm. which I have a problem believing because the type 2 is usually, you know, 7 to 8 foot, but it's all black and it's got like the no heads. Most reports I get around here, they're red. Red. They're red. Yeah. They're either red or black. Hmm. Um, and they're much taller, than you know, they're bigger. They're not... You know, everyone thinks the southern Bigfoot's real small. Maybe in Florida and Texas. Yeah, that's you know, more skunk, skunk ape. ape. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But the ones up here, I've had reports. I've had a report of a 12-footer. And the guy knew it was 12 foot because it, it came up, its head came up right where its window of, of the house was. And he saw the top of the head and his window was 12 foot hmm. from hmm. the ground. So, I mean, you know, you never know. But then again, I have a theory about the way they migrate. I think they're in constant migration. I think when, hmm. you know, it's real cold up in the north, they go south. Yeah. And I think when it gets hot down here, or not, when it gets hot in the south, they go to Canada and they go up in there because of the food sources. And I also think that's why the Appalachian Trail is such a hot spot for them in those areas because they migrate. And I think the same yeah. I think that goes with all cryptids. I think Dogman does the same thing. I don't think they necessarily migrate as far as what people used to think. They used to think they'd come down from like Canada and cruise all the way across the U.S. and go back again. I think they're more in pockets. No. Where they have like a region or a territory that they they inhabit and they stay and they migrate in that in that sort of area. Of course, what? So you get like four or five because if you subscribe to the whole, there's a government knowledge of all of this. No, we don't talk about that. Well, I do. <laughs> there's government knowledge of, of Sasquatches and all that, and they sort of have, they they know where they are and what ranges and territories where they are. And they keep an eye on it. Then you, you know, when they when something goes wrong, then you have stories of like what happened up in Boone, where they send in a team for rogue, whatever Bigfoot going crazy, maybe a young youth Bigfoot, that and they sort of have Silva them corralled. Yeah, yeah, there's Silva. a couple different places. Boone, but, Silva, and, and where they were yeah. fighting them, and uh, also there was one in um, a couple in California, but uh, the alleged Bigfoot response team. I don't know what they call them. Black you know. Mountain. Yeah, there was yeah. a couple in Black Mountain. Yeah, there's been. Uh, but see that kind of there was like 14. Which is funny because that's where we used to live at one time. I kind of think the... It's like right there where that area is. The larger so. migratory pattern would be feasible because, I mean, like the Mexican gray wolf has a migratory pattern of over 200 miles, you know? So something much larger, it would have to be bigger. Yeah, but I don't However, think However, it... with the government keeping them under control or... Alleged various, control. Alleged, yes. Or the fact that... We start hearing FBI ticking. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard it. You don't want that. I'm telling or you right the, now. You or the it. fact of encroachment. You know, human yeah. encroachment has probably put them in these pockets. So it kind of parallels what we've seen these days with the higher concentration of Bigfoot sightings being near the Appalachian Trail head and then at the far north Canadian head. They go around but the whole thing. when they do have to migrate... That's when the we're going to go back to David Polites missing four one one. Did those people encounter Bigfoot in the heart of the Appalachian Trail? Well, on top of that, too, you, you can't you can't discount climate change. True. Like we have Canadian geese that used to migrate from Canada down and go to Florida. They don't even do that anymore. They don't need to because it's not cold. It's not cold <laughs> enough. So, like, I mean, if you think about the area we're in here, like in Western North Carolina, it's not as cold as it used to be. You can, I mean, you get snow for a couple, three, four days, depending on what elevation you're at. But I mean, well, take this winter. It's a prime example. You're right. You're still cutting your grass in December. Yeah, but look at this so, winter. This this hasn't been much of a winter. No, I mean it's over. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. And you're right. I was watching. They were cutting grass down the street from my house yesterday. So yeah. I mean, the winter's winter's done. I mean, it's it's spring. And, and so if the weather, if the climate's getting pretty mild overall, and you're right. But I also think they still do migrate. But you know, I have a whole theory about if if you want to get it like into the park system and how that was all created. If you look at it like on maps, I think. If there was some kind of government conspiracy, it started a long time ago, and the Parks Department was used as part of that because these massive tracts of land that the government kept are where most of the sightings have been occurring since the Europeans came here. I would and agree with that. I think that probably could all be mixed in if one was to go conspiracy, which I I'm would, not, but if one was to. I would agree you with could that, do that, but not with that intent. I would actually agree that, it, yes, it is more. Teddy of Roosevelt a, is the one that did the parks department. More of a catch all, right. because it's not just like the cryptid thing. I'm going into, I know this sounds silly, but I strongly believe the Bermuda Triangle moves, it migrates as well. 
Pacific Northwest has its own Bermuda Triangle. I'm, I'm not saying that's not possible. You know, I've been in the Bermuda Triangle, and I, I feel it. as though some of these parks, which um, don't make sense to maybe me, maybe sailor guy here, <laughs> <laughs> gone through the Bermuda, yeah, all the time. It, yeah. If it's based off what it's supposed to be based off, and magnetics yeah. has a lot to do with it, shifts. Yeah, it's like Devil's Triangle shifts. It's not. You know, uh, it's not like a line you can see in yeah. the ocean. It, the whole thing moves. Magnetic north moves. And shifts. Because so. the park system does not, if you take a critical modern eye to it, it doesn't make sense. However, if you were to fall down the Teddy Roosevelt, CCC conspiracy, things like that, then it starts to make sense. Again, yeah, and it's like so. I said, the only reason I even put Teddy Roosevelt in the mix is because yeah. he was the one that promoted the Bauman incident yeah. in his book. I mean, it's there. And that was 1896. You know? Yeah. So, I mean... It, did did that decision as well as other decisions that he was uh, he had influence in cause him to create the parks in such a way? It's you know? it's possible. We don't know. Yeah, I mean, and that goes beyond cryptid. Like, I mean, the little I know it hit BuzzFeed a couple of years ago. That whole little section between Montana and Canada and some other weird places where you can commit murder. Oh, the headless highway, Is that something like that. Saying? Yeah, <laughs> or the fact that South Dakota and Montana. Have yeah, there's them. places the way the parks overlap, yeah. and if you if a murder gets committed in the park, nobody can nobody claims it. So there's no jurisdiction, so it doesn't. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's or, not good. Though. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Any. <clears throat> Any national park in South Dakota, as well as Wyoming, has the highest concentration of missing indigenous women. Yeah. See, yeah. now, I, I have seen that, and that's that's <clears throat> creepy, because yeah. they have no idea what's going because on Because that is beyond missing 411, and that's beyond, unfortunately, the, the cruelty and depravity of man. Yeah. There is no excuse for how many indigenous women are going missing in those areas, except maybe... It's possible. Yeah, you know. It's possible. Because look at the look at the Native American folklore. Yeah. They were either cannibals, they're afraid of the women and the children being stolen. And and for nefarious purposes. So I mean And it wasn't just afraid. It was like a it was almost as though they were conditioning their culture to get used to the idea. Like well, this is so commonplace. Yeah, the, the, the whole thing yeah. is really geared towards outsiders staying away from outsiders. Yeah. Well, right, I, rightfully I mean, so. Because didn't Judah so. Culla here in North Carolina, didn't he take a native wife? Oh, yeah, several. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> he, uh, he did a lot, you know. He, he, wasn't so. a good, he was a trickster. Yeah, which yeah. tricksters, and then he disappeared. Where did he disappear to? So I think he disappeared. Well, I mean, him. if he took up time between the two realms like they're saying he did, who knows? Yeah. So, I mean. Well, that goes in theory with my cave so. system because Judah Culla Rock and his cave and the Devil's Courthouse. That was all possibly connected by yeah. cave systems. So. Well, sure, but you got to prove it. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> That's the hard part. That's like if you look at hey the man, caves. Everyone's well, got to prove something. You, have the, you also have the cave systems that happen, like in the Southwest, where you have like Carlsbad Caverns is actually connected all the way to like Hemis Falls, where we were. And past that is trying to, to figure out how they're connected. When you're talking basically, you know, thousands of miles of cave systems. Yeah, I don't. There's I don't an opening think. in Geronimo Springs that they just proved hits the Mexican border. Actually, yeah, there's there's yeah. been people who've died at the Blue Hole in New Mexico in Santa Rosa, and then magically show up in Carlsbad Caverns, which is like 300 miles away. Yeah, it's like they went down and they came up there, and like so you're in this cavern with this supposedly <laughs> bottomless lake, which is like 40, 70 feet, and whatever it is, <laughs> and then a body floats up. It's like, how the hell does that happen? You know. Yeah. 50 yeah. foot. <laughs> well, there's also bottomless lakes that uh, Billy, the kid, and his, his team when he was out there, his, the bad guy team, yeah. they called them the bottomless lakes because they would go and they, they would try to figure out how deep the bottom was. And when they got down to a certain depth, about 60 feet, it, the current was so strong that it would just pull the line. So Because they're just doing the whole knot at every six foot like you're trying to find knots, mm-hmm. right? And they would just pull it. And they're like, yep, it's bottomless. Yeah. But you die there, you wind up in Carlsbad. And there's places where, so, like... Which means that you're going hundreds of miles underground, like, who knows how deep. So. You know, like, Sitting Bull claimed that a... Pretty much the equivalent of Sasquatch told him where certain cave systems were. Yeah. So he took this advice from Sasquatch, and those are the cave routes that he would use to ambush people. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay. You know, apparently, though, there's folklore that says, that, you know, they used to have their own language, and they could communicate, and even well, at one point speak, time, they used fire. They... Yeah. It, allegedly, the... The language that they spoke was the language of the language of the Anastasi, which yeah. is the the oldest. They're older than the Indians that were here. Yeah. And so they, they called it the ancient tongue, and it was like and see, and that's what we talk about with a lot of the the Navajo. They know that you know Bigfoot speaks the native tongue. So if they couldn't speak the native tongue, then they wouldn't interact because that's an offense to Bigfoot. Mm. 
Well, and so I've, their stories, yeah. man, just kind of keep going I've and spoken going. To so. I've spoken to people on the Cherokee Reservation. They'll tell you straight up that Bigfoot around here, Sukaloo, yeah. speaks Cherokee. Hmm. They'll hear, they'll, they'll, he'll yeah. speak Cherokee if he wants to. He hmm. understands it. But, you know, he's going to do what he wants to do, whether you like it or not. Yeah. So that's an interesting question, though. Are you the type of team that would play Cherokee noises or vocabulary to bring out or trigger Bigfoot? I mean, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but realistically, I really don't want to play anything. I don't know what's being said. Okay. I mean, you know. So you're saying you don't want to get your arm tripped off and that would stuff be, Yeah. Like I, mean, <laughs> that's, that's I'm still, I still have to deal with the fact that one day I have to watch Tiny ride a Bigfoot. To oblivion, you know, <laughs> and explain that to his family. It's the next Jurassic Park. Just exactly. gotta make sure. Just make sure it's not the wrong season, bro. Yeah, because well, it might, will be my luck. Yeah, it's like because they might like redheads. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, did you know that Bigfoots have a mating season? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's like Daniel does. Oh God, Tiny will talk about it. So give us an idea of what's coming up for the Ash- Asheville Cryptid Society. Well, thanks for asking. Um, we've got a really cool summer planned. Uh, what we want to do is this summer, uh, 2019. Well, f- before you do that, how can they get? A, how can somebody get a hold of you? Oh, I'm I'm easy to get a hold of. Just AshevilleCryptidSociety.com or AshevilleCryptidSociety@gmail.com. Uh, so it's cryptids with an S in there, right? No, it's cryptid. Okay, cryptid. So it's cryptid society. Cryptid society. Man, just want to make com. sure. Piece of cake. Um, this summer we've got a really big planned event. Uh, and if we're lucky, we'll have some help, specifically from maybe Crypt Geeks and M and D Paranormal. Um, uh. Sounds familiar. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, um, this is going to be the uh, Cryptid Cave Systems event. Uh, we're going into three different states. Uh, we're going underwater in one to try to prove that all these cave systems are connected, and that cryptids in this particular part of the country use them to go back and forth. Hmm. So I think hmm. we're gonna have a good time with that. And so, what are you calling that? The cryptid cave? What? The cryptid cave systems. Cryptid cave systems event. Event, and uh, well, hopefully we'll, we'll have down. some good luck with that. <laughs> I will also be announcing this. This is the first time it's been announced officially. Ooh, very nice. But I will uh, thank you for allowing me to have this platform for it too. And uh, I will be talking about this uh, on uh, April second at six thirty p.m. at the REI in Asheville. I'm doing a little Bigfoot one hundred and one class there. And we will be talking about this as well. And if you are in the Asheville area, he does still have seats available. We'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, click on that link, and from there you can register to attend that class. Yes, reserve seating. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Hopefully we'll sell out. <laughs> yeah. Only Bigfoot. He's the only one who doesn't need a reservation. Just show up, he can please. Show. We'll VIP him. Yes. Sasquatch. <laughs> Sam squashes. Yes. <clears throat> and now... We do have a little section that we usually talk about at the end of these newer podcasts for Creep Geeks, and that is the creature feature. Um, We'll start it off with these guys, though. What is your favorite cryptid? Is it me? Yes. (laughs) You're a cryptid. He's like, hello? (laughs) Hello? No. He's going to sing that song, I Can Be Your Cryptid Baby. (laughs) (laughs) No, but seriously, though, what is your favorite cryptid animal or creature? Or being. Or just cryptid. For me, I've got to go traditionally. I've got to go with my main Sasquatch. Okay. I, I have to. I, that's <laughs> that's the one that got me into the whole thing. I've got to go with the foot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I've heard both of you talk a little bit more recently about Dogman. Mm. But when it comes down to it, Bigfoot? I love Dogman. Don't get me wrong. I think Dogman is awesome. Okay. But the truth be told... I, I want, like, the cool Bigfoot. I'm talking about the ones in Alaska, 15-foot tall. Pacific you know, Northwest? Pacific Northwest yeah. type one. Mm. I like I like it because there's a, a mysticism that goes along with it. Hmm. The the roots run deep, hmm. you know. And Dogman, for me, is a relatively newcomer. Hmm. You know, I, I mean, for me, I don't know that much about Dogman. I'm just learning. Bigfoot, I've had my own experiences, you know, those deep roots, that mysticism, that you know, everything can tie in that native culture of, you know, they're they're just another tribe of people. Hmm. Albeit they need a shave and a bath. <laughs> but I think that's part of what it is for me. So you think it's more you think they're more of like an ancients um, kind of tribe of people or do you think they're more animal? I think they're more than animal. Hmm. I really do. Well, which which group though? I mean, that's the thing. Because if you look at like skunk apes, I think they're more along the lines of being more animalistic. Yeah. Well, I think everything, so. even even people, 
you know, if you took a group of people and, and left them out in the woods, they're going to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to regress. All right. You know, Lost colony. It's, <laughs> you know, it's it's all about survival, right? Wait a minute. So when you say that, are you thinking it's like a lost group of people who've regressed to become Bigfoot? Or, see, no. I'm looking at it a little bit differently. I'm looking at it as being is that through, through development or whatever, Bigfoot has always sort of been Bigfoot. Yes. Gigantopithecus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah kind of. I think I think Bigfoot and and the tribe of Bigfoot have always been the tribe of Bigfoot, but there are are sections of Bigfoot that have regressed, and that's where you get your different types mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. Bigfoot. It's like your patties being the type the one, bigger, smarter yeah. ones, and so yeah. forth and so on. And then you you go into the more animalistic ones. It's survival. It's terrain. It's it's a lot of different things. It's breeding. Yeah, yeah. Breeding population. Yeah. yeah. So then you get like a then, Yeah, because you can get into really the really sort of scary theories that, you know, hey, every once in a while they got to claim a, a woman, a human woman. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I don't know. It's in so. the folklore. That's every culture. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, but I mean, also, if you really, because so, like I said, it's been. You know, it's also Bigfoot's, a species. He's because, on freaking beef jerky. I mean, Everybody, oh, he's so wonderful. I don't, using I don't. the Homo sati- uh, sapiens species <laughs> aside, <laughs> yes, I know. Anyways, <laughs> All right. they now have coyotes that are already wolf hybrids yeah. now mating down with chihuahuas in Arizona. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastically terrifying thought. Like be one ugly a pack dog. of tiny mm. tiny wolves going at you. Would that be I a, a <laughs> coyote coyote hoo 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 yeah, I mean, wolf? Chihuahua. Yeah. Chihuahua. I like I'm, and you know originally we thought you know wolf was this far away from dog but now we're starting nah, to see not it's anymore. not. If Bigfoot exists, how close or how far away genetically is he from us? I mean, so. it's, it's always that, you know, is when people refer to him as like a people or a missing tribe or something like that, then you have to account the fact that they're part human. Yeah. If that's true, then you have to look at things completely well, different. Like if you, well, that factors in with lore, too. If you factor right. in with, with, with native lore, <clears throat> you know, being able to speak with the ancients and all that, they had a tongue they could communicate, then, you know, you can't separate them. But if, Too far if, from that. if that is true, though, say that is true, then hypothetically, and we're genetically linked to them. Now, do they have a soul? Are they human? Are they? Do they get the same rights as us? That that opens up that opens up this whole different realm of questioning. We look at Bigfoot as you know. You and I have made several you know jokes. It's aggressive, just from what we've. Personally, I don't know. Is it aggressive? I think so. Yeah. But I I think it's aggressive because it deserves. It needs to be aggressive when it comes to man. I mean, we're well, I, I look at it being the aggressive as being a little bit different. I, I think that Bigfoot sure has interactions if if they exist and all that other disclaimer crap, right? Maybe some a lot of the interactions that they have have not been yeah, positive because you can't. I mean, so you, you would teach your kids, hey, stay away from the cars, right. stay away from the highways. Like they do the same thing, but I think it, if it's in a point where um, you're out there doing his thing, because they put out territorial markers, and you if you're out there and you're not paying attention, you're in their territory. And they've got to be highly territorial. I mean, you know, everything from the, the, the signs you see in the woods, the, the trees and everything else and being placed certain ways. And, you know, it gets to a certain point where I think that by the time you see it, it's wanting you to see it because it's letting you know, look, dude, you're about four steps away from me evicting you from my territory, mm-hmm. which makes the whole angry animal thing. Well, exactly. But they also but most have of us don't know what to look for. Well, I understand. But most of them have, I mean, there's an intelligence level there. Well, yeah, That's of course. Explainable. I mean, they're not just a primate. They're not just a monkey in the woods. I mean, there's something above that. Hmm. Otherwise, they're you know they'd be all over the place. I mean, they'd be swinging in the trees right now. So they've learned over time to avoid man, and that's simply because we're dangerous. We're a threat. Especially you know we have these big sticks that lightning comes out of, and then something drops you know at a distance away. So hmm. I mean. I think if, if that is a possibility and if they are part of a tribe or if they are part human, they're smart enough to realize that staying away from us is the only thing that keep them alive. Yeah, yeah. Or they're clone workers. There's that theory, too, so. that, that they were <laughs> yeah. here. Well, and there was uh, a few years ago I read an article that uh, placed every Bigfoot sighting within the same vicinity as a UFO sighting. Yeah. Oh, I've yeah. heard... I've heard of that, that goes stories. into the whole clone drone worker thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you want if you want something to go out there and do uh, do some rough and tumble work out in the woods, Bigfoot's the animal, man. That's your man. Mm-hmm. So, That's one. I don't know. Is that go dig that gold? <laughs> it's like, yeah, 
Get the minerals. We need the minerals all. Let's let's go all L. Ron Hubbard style. Yeah. Oh, no. We're coming to you next on the podcast. No. We talk about yeah. no. Dianetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not doing that. No. So don't don't even okay, we're not doing that. All righty. So I think we're at this point where in the podcast where we're gonna quit. Yep. It's time to stop. Definitely. I yeah. quit 10 minutes ago. I know. All links to Asheville Cryptid Society will be in the show notes. You can click on those to register for the Bigfoot in Western North Carolina and Appalachia talk, as well as if reaching them directly on their website and email address. And they do have phone numbers. Yes, that's true. Those will be on there as well. What phone number is a good phone number for them? For I don't because I saw two. <laughs> uh, the Which best phone number, number do you prefer? Uh, the one that I give out the most is the 828 828- Four zero seven zero zero four six. All right. So we have two phone numbers. So if you want to get a hold of Asheville Cryptid Society, maybe call and leave a message, that kind of thing, or ask some questions. 828-407-0046. And that is just about it. So, mm-hmm. And I just want to thank you guys for having me on. It's been a blast oh, to absolutely. do this again. We will do this again because there's always news. There's always updated stuff to talk about. So it should be. It should be fun. So be exciting. Be sure to follow us on Facebook. Uh, that's where we put our big announcements as well as our podcast episodes. Uh, listen to us on iTunes. Give us a rating. Give us a review on Facebook. Both those are important to us. Join the Facebook group. That's where we have our big conversations. We get show ideas. We get leads. And it's also where we talk about fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we will also put social links to Asheville Cryptid Society in the show notes for this podcast. If you want to contact Creep Geeks, that's going to be omi at creepgeeks.com or greg at creepgeeks.com. Business inquiries, be sure to use contact at creepgeeks.com. And that's about it. All right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, thank you very much for listening. See you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. I like being a bird. Peanut butter, peanut, peanut butter. I like peanut butter. I like peanut butter. I like peanut butter. Peanut, peanut butter. I like 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 peanut butter.